Welcome to Foundations for Figma, our most in-depth Figma course for beginners. Today we will learn the basics of design tokens, styles and libraries inside Figma. My name is Ansh Mehra and I teach students design and AI. This is lecture 3 of our 10 lecture free series. So without wasting any further time, let's get started. Alright, welcome to lecture 3 of Foundations of Figma. Super excited, we've already covered lecture 1 and lecture 2. In lecture 1, we did the basics of Figma from scratch. In lecture 2, we dig really, really deep into how frames and auto layouts work. Today in lecture 3, we will be covering styles and libraries. I personally feel that now we're finally moving to topics that give you a glimpse of what Figma really is why it is so powerful. By the way, this is going to be a 10 lecture course and you will find a lot of more resources around UX design specifically for designers who are applying for jobs who are writing their case studies on learnuiux.in. This is where we have our premium offerings, information about our meetups, events, mentorship and a lot more. But this course is a Figma course, it's available for free. So let's check out today's syllabus. It is split into three modules. In module number one, I will cover the basics of this very interesting concept called design tokens and then styles inside Figma and we'll understand why do we even need them. In module number two, we'll study a real design system by Uber and we'll figure out how big companies design. And in module number three, I will show you how do you declare textiles, how do you declare color styles inside Figma, how is the practical implementation when you're actually designing an app. Now throughout this entire tutorial, if I hover over something, you'll see the zoomed in cursor. On the top right corner, you will see if I have pressed any key, so there is absolutely no ambiguity left. So let's start with module number one, where we understand the basics of tokens and designs. So folks, the thing is that when you are creating an application, you of course have your basic shapes, which is rectangles, ellipses and lines, but you need to put some color to it, right? A UI will look really, really bad if you don't have color in it. But when we talk about colors, your entire UI screen is actually made up of at least three buckets of colors. Even when you see this screen right now, right? Even when you're watching this video on YouTube, you would realize that you have some very, very basic grays, you know, it could be like light gray, dark grays. The text is also either black or gray, but then there are some areas where you can see bright colors, right? For example, here in Figma, you can see this blue color right here, this blue color right here, uh, this selected panel, even on YouTube, you can see the red color here and there. So they are in a different category. The grays that create the surface are in a different category. And then sometimes when there's an error state, when you delete something or when there's an alert or when there's a warning, even then you have a different set of colors. So in reality, if I had to split a color bank of a UI, I would split it into three buckets. The first one are my grays. So basically, if I were to show you, anytime you create an application, you basically need at least your basic grays which can start from black and then slowly, slowly, gradually, they can move towards white. Now, it is very, very important that you first understand whether you're creating a light themed app or a dark theme app because they decide how your colors will look like. Let's just assume that we are creating a light themed app. In that case, assume that most of your colors start from pitch white and then slowly, slowly they go to black, right? So if I were to say, uh, define a number for color white, it would probably be one. And as I go from one to maybe 10, 10 would be pure black, right? So then in between you have multiple shades and then you define all of those shades one by one. Now, let me give you a quick example of this. If I were to go and type UI design, okay. And let's just go to Mobin because Mobin is a very cool website. It's a very reliable website that I keep using for inspiration, right? So this has a bunch of screens right here. So let's just say I go to this one right here. So this is by Luma, right? This is for hosting events. Now, if I open any of these screens, let's just open say this one. Oh, okay. So you'd notice that you have all of these grays right here, but then in some cases you have this green color tag as well. You have these icons as well, right? And you often need very, very subtle shades of gray, specifically if you're working in light theme. Now, if I were to select any application, which is probably say in dark theme, let's check out something which is in dark theme, 
Mm-mm-mm. Yeah, this one. So Tesla is essentially a dark theme app, right? So when you enter here, you realize that you have, of course, your blacks, but then you have subtle dark shades of gray as well. Now, very interesting thing to note here that is that in a dark theme, as the surface comes near you, it becomes lighter in shade because there's a very important dark theme principle in user interface design. And it says that right in front of the screen, there is an assumed source of light. So for example, if I were to take a look at this thing right here, this color is darker, whereas this color is lighter. Why? Because this is on top of the surface. So anything that comes closer to me will be in lighter shade. That is why you'd notice that input fields are usually darker. Why? Because they're on the inside. In this case, this card is on the top. This card is again on top of this card. That is why it gets lighter and lighter as you move towards the screen. Now, something very different happens when we switch to the light theme. In light theme, you'd realize that you don't have something which is pitch, pitch dark, but usually in a lot of UI designs, they keep either a simple white color. For example, in here, they have simple white color stuck on the uh, top fold, and then they'll put like a very gray, like a shade of white, like a darker shade of white at the back. But the underlying principle still remains the same. So here we have light colors and light shades. In dark theme, we had very, very dark shades. But the principle remains the same because see how this white card is on a brighter note. So the surface is gray, but the card is white. But again, if I were to put down all of these colors in different brackets, the surface colors come in a separate bracket. These brand primary colors come in a separate bracket. And if you were to see any of the delete buttons or any of the alert buttons, they will come in a separate category altogether. So I can't see them right now. Uh, but yeah, for example, this is like a success one, right? So this is not a brand color. This is not a surface color. It's a different category altogether. And these are called semantics. Now, of course, I keep saying this again and again that this is not a UX design course. This is actually a Figma course. So we won't go too deep into understanding what are these grays and brand colors and semantic colors. We've already created a 15 episode course, which was for free on UX design. There I have a video called declaring your UI palette. So there I explain this in detail, but just to make sure everybody's on the same page on this specific topic. First, we declare our grace. So let's just assume that we have a light themed app, right? And I'll start from scratch. Okay. So I will create a box and let me make this as white. Now you can't see this because obviously it's in front of a white surface. Now I will make a copy of this. And I have two ways to make this gray. Either I can hold the shift key and press the down arrow. So it creates a nudge amount. So it automatically creates a gray and I can duplicate and I can actually go and press command D again and again. And this is not the exact way to do this. I am just doing this so that, you know, it's easier to understand. It's quick, but I will just press down arrow again. Okay. Maybe here I'll press another down arrow again. Uh, just to make sure that we have something darker. So I can copy this hex code and, you know, paste this here. And it completely depends on you as to how many shades do you want, right? In most cases, I usually recommend people to take their entire gray palette and split it into three parts. Okay. When it comes to grays, if you are working for a light theme, then first comes your base colors. So these are colors that are very close to the color white because we're working in your light theme. Then we have some mid colors that are actually sort of moving towards the gray shade. So I'll keep these as my basis and maybe these three as my mid colors. So what I can do is I can probably go and make this even darker. Then let's delete this. Let's duplicate this and make this even more darker. So they will come in my mid category. Now I will also need the colors that are very, very contrasting to white. So this time, let me just go and select pitch black. Okay, let me keep this at the very end of the spectrum and I will create two copies and this time let me just increase the brightness like this. Let's copy this hex code, paste it right here and then increase it again. So just make sure that this color and this color are not like too, too uh, similar. But yes, now I can take these up. Let's tidy them up. Let's take these, tidy them up as well. So these ones right here become my base colors inside grays, by the way, these become my mid colors and these become my contrast colors. And now you would say that Anj, there are three of them. So 
how do you differentiate in between the three bases so it would be base 1 base 2 base 3 mid 1 mid 2 mid 3 contrast 1 contrast 2 contrast 3 right so this is how you can do that now when it comes to brand colors brand colors are not usually decided by the ux designer they are usually decided by a brand designer so let's say in mcdonald's the brand colors are maybe yellow and red for facebook they are blue and white right so there's always one primary color and then one accent color so maybe in Facebook's case, blue color is the brand primary and white is the accent color. So you need those brand colors specifically when you're making buttons. So let me show you a real example. Let's come back to Mobin. Let's find something in the education section. So if I were to go to Duolingo, you would realize that Duolingo has a very bright, like a green, happy, uh, sunshine color as their brand primary color. But when I go into the app, uh, let's just say, I come and probably go to the next floor. Let's see. If I were to check out, say this one right here, right? So now you have some of the brand colors, but you also have a bit of grace, right? So my grace come in this category, the stroke of this message, uh, the text right here, the text right here. But then you also have some brand colors that are filling the key phrases and all of these things, right? So brand colors are usually decided uh, by your marketing designer. But if you don't have somebody on your startup, then you probably have to end up, uh, you know, deciding the brand colors. And in that case, uh, you can always learn about color theory, but don't keep more than two, three brand colors. Then you have semantics, which are basically like for alert colors, warning colors, success colors. They are usually the same for alert. People put any shades of red for warning. They have yellow and for success, they have greens. So when it comes to grays, you have bases, mids and contrast, but for brand colors, there's no base mid contrast. There's just the brand color. Even in semantics, it's just the main color. In a lot of cases, let's just say you're making a button system and in the button system, you have different states, right? So you have primary, default, disabled, all of those stuff. So in hover, you need a version of the brand primary color, which is slightly darker. So let's just say that this is my brand primary, okay? I will also have to create another color which is darker than this, but you can't just randomize this dark color. So the right way to do this is that I click on plus and maybe I make this at 20%, right? Then I make another copy and choose the eye picker tool and select this hex code right here because when I create a style, I want to make sure that I'm putting this as my second color. So this is my default color. This would be my hover state color. I can't sort of mix these two things together when we're doing in code. So the right way would be to do this, right? And then you can repeat the same thing for your warning and success colors and everything else in case you need that, right? Now, the fun part is that uh, today we are only covering styles, but in reality, a lot of these things, a lot of these color combinations and the usage of these grays and the uses of these brand colors, they are done using this concept called tokens. So in today's section, I will give you a brief understanding of how tokens work and then we will cover how styles work. But styles don't really fulfill the requirements that a token needs. So for tokens, Figma has introduced a new feature altogether and it's called variables and we will cover that eventually in the course. But today I'll just introduce you what are color tokens. I will just introduce to you as to what are styles and we'll keep things very, very simple. So let me introduce you to the problem statement. See, when it comes to a hex code, when you are designing, you can't really keep communicating with your designers that, oh, can you make this button 7FE52E? Like it's terrible to say that. So basically you need easy to understand names that help you understand what this color is about. So let's just say that this hex code right here, this is the root value, okay? This is the actual hex code value. But maybe I'm building a system where I call this color as yellow one. Now I can have multiple yellows. That is why I've said yellow one. I can have yellow two, yellow three, just how I had here, right? I had base one, base two, base three, right? So even here I can have yellow one, yellow two, yellow three. So this entire concept of giving a new name to a very complicated number, this is basically called abstraction. So what is abstraction? When you're driving a car and when you change your gears, for you, you're just changing a gear and sort of moving it forward and backward. But in reality, when you're shifting that gear, a lot of things are changing inside the car, but you are not aware of it because the designer of the car has done abstraction. 
he has made sure that every technicality is just hidden and you just have one point of control which is the gear in this case i am using the value yellow 1 and i'm using it as an abstraction to make sure that i don't have to regularly say this complicated word again and again now the fancy word would be that i am using an alias alias means an alternate name for the same root value another important thing here to know is that at one point i might be using yellow 1 for different use cases so of course i have a hex code this hex code i'm just calling it as yellow 1 but maybe yellow 1 is being used in some other icon in some other place it's being used as a success notification in some other place it's being used for a verification icon like the same yellow one is being used in other other places so you have more branches of the same color and this entire thing is possible only because of this abstraction now i know this will take some time please spend this half an hour this one hour with me i'll take at least one hour to make you understand how these tokens work and you know throughout this process in the middle you'll be like i didn't get what he said i know it happened to me as well so i need you to listen and give me time and i will explain you how this works because i have tons of examples to make this clear to you right now we'll just keep things to a single level okay we have 7f whatever and i'm calling this as yellow one let's assume that this yellow one is now a token for me so this alias name this alternate name this yellow one is now a token that redirects me to this hex value now right now this example is showing you me giving a simple name to this color but you can have tokens for type styles or type sizes of even the spacings or the borders basically anything that you need to define and make it into a rule so that nobody can just come and you know change yellow one let's just say if i don't have these tokens and some other designer is working on any screen and he is using the same icon that requires yellow one if this yellow one is not defined he will have to use the uh, eye dropper eye picker tool to sort of choose the yellow color and probably he might just sort of make a mistake or something like that but if i define a rule that if you are using this success icon you can only use yellow one then he has to use that token now moving forward if i say that instead of yellow one all of these tick signs will have yellow two then i will have to make change in just one single part and if i make change in that one single part it will be reflected in every other place where yellow one was used so this is basically you building a very very robust system now you can also do this for shadows and a lot of stuff right but typically when it comes to color styles today we will just figure out how do we tokenize colors okay and it's just a a way to give easy to read names to hex codes now let's go a level deeper and understand that when i name this color as say yellow 100 because this is a very common convention yellow 100 can be used in different ways right it can be used as a text or an icon so then what happens is that when a company is being built you make a set of colors which are your hex codes then you give names to those hex codes but then as a designer or as a marketing designer the marketing team is also taking out colors from that same bank no matter what team you're in all these different teams come to this one single yellow 100 and then they might take yellow 100 and then use it in their own individual system so mobile team is using its own system with yellow 100 this ipad team is using its own so what happens is that you start with root value then you give it a global name in this case it is yellow 100 but then we have the system name or the alias name in this case maybe i call it as semantic alert maybe i'm building a web app and inside my web app i am using this inside the semantic alert icon like whatever it is it is in a component on my web app then i can dig deeper and say that even within a specific pop up i am using the same color in the icon fill as well specifically in the alert icon fill as well So when it comes to a specific component you can create more layers it's like layering of the names but they all redirect to this one single color so you can have as many levels as you want right but in most design systems they just keep it to three levels like they have a normal name and then the normal name has an alias and people just say that this is either an alias or a component specific like it depends on you and i will show you the examples it will become very very clear to you but the thing is that in reality the token names are not that simple so right now i've sort of made that okay yellow 100 is now called alert icon fill 
I have just simplified it to a very dumb level. In reality, the token names are pretty complicated, and I will explain you how to name those tokens as well. But just bear with me. Slowly, slowly, we will cover this. A very important thing to understand is that colors can have multiple levels of layering, but when it comes to shadows. or when it comes to even like glowing effects or when it comes to other styles whether it's type styles or spacing there you will not have so many layers in most design systems when it comes to say font sizes they'll just have 8 12 and 16 8 will be called small 12 will be called medium and maybe 16 will be called large and that is where they stop right people don't really say that small then becomes mobile heading a uh, medium then becomes web heading like they don't do that in most cases people just keep it on a single level it is only in the colors where people have multiple levels of hierarchy multiple levels of you know tiers now let me give you a practical example let's take this prompt right here which is like a plan choosing app and by the way this is from a free open source uh, figma community file called untitled ui in this case you have a root value which is the color blue now i can give it a global name which is blue 100 then after blue 100 is established i can say that this comes under my primary brand color okay so i will put it in my ui category imagine that the marketing team is also using this global name ka uh, entire palette the web team is also working and the marketing team everybody is using blue 100 for their own individual use cases but right now i am in the product team the product team is building a ui within the ui we have named this as primary one okay now once it has been named as primary one i also decided that the same primary one might be used for this check icon right here and also for the modal text so in this case blue 100 is first referenced as ui primary one and then ui primary one is then again linked to the check icon and the modal text so these two will be component specific token names but this thing right here this is going to be a system specific token name now the system specific component specific these are not uh rules this is just my way of organizing people might call this as you know not component specific but instance specific some people instead of a uh, system specific they will call it as device specific whatever it is it is just dependent on how you want to organize them but the benefit of this is that maybe say one year down the line i decide that modal text is going to be black in that case i can just break this branch right here and connect it to some other alias name and it will work out very very well now If you've understood something so far, I know that a lot of this is complicated. You will have some clarity, but you're if you're enjoying and if you're really really finding this useful, don't forget to click on subscribe and hit the bell icon. Now let's take another example. On the left we have a web dropdown component, and on the right we have a web sidebar. Here, if you notice, there's a hover state. Okay, this thing right here, we have a hover state for this, and here we have my email right below my name. now both of them have the same color okay but the use cases are very different so here my root value is 91 then i named this as my global name as gray 100 then gray 100 has an alias of base 1 okay which is this thing right here so you remember we created base 1 for our grays so in some cases i have used the same gray color in my grays but then i have also used the same for my secondary text this is my secondary text right here so this would be a token name this would be a token name this would be a token name and now i'm just using tokens to do more and more abstraction but please note real token names don't look like this so let's understand how do you name these tokens and to be honest there is no one way for it let me just uh, break this down to you there are many many ways people have all of these different kinds of use cases it really depends on how complicated you can be right and i usually keep things very very simple so i'll show you some simple ways as well i'll show you how big companies do it as well So right here, uh, I have a bunch of components. Okay, this is a label. These are three buttons. This is a toggle. All of them use the same color. Okay. Now what you need to do is when you are creating token names in your startup or when you are just building out, building you know your design system, you need to make sure that your token names are the shortest and the simplest. And you can always take reference from other systems as well. So I will paste a link of at least five to six resources where you can learn from design systems. and uh, you can actually learn as to how this brand is naming their tokens and you can take references from them as well but in most cases the token name firstly most importantly tells you the use case it tells you that whether this token name is for a color or for a type style or for a shadow or for a space and i'll show you examples i'm just letting you know as to what all the token name should convey so the most important thing 
is a purpose as to what is this category for second could be a property when you, you know whether this is a background fill or whether this is just a stroke you know stuff like that and then sometimes you can go very component specific as well you can say that even though this is a color token even though within a color token this is a background fill this is a background fill for just a button this is the background fill for just a radio button so you go very component specific as well but when it comes to components you can also have states so right here i have three buttons okay the same color here it is being used for surface here it is being used for the text okay here it is also being used for text so you can also say that within the button what state is in that button is it in the default state or the hover state or the disable state and now it is absolutely not necessary to use all of these things i'm just letting you know as to how people try these out so let's take an example we have this alert button right here okay this would be my root value which is the actual hex code then i give the hex code a global name which would be blue 100 and now for this specific fill i will not assign blue 100 to this i will first create another token call it ui because this is for the ui library then pill which is my component then primary which is the state of the pill because this pill has another primary secondary tertiary variant inside the primary pill this is only used for the background when i create this token now i will have this as my token color and this would be linked to this fill now one very very important thing to note is that i have used dashes and not slash please don't use slash because it will end up complicating a lot of your code now if i were to do the same for my buttons now this is the same button but now this button has two different states the color is the same so root value is 75 whatever it is the global name is also the same but now in this case i will create a new token which is my component token and i will call it as ui within ui it is a button within button it is for the primary button within the primary button this is just for the background and this is in the active state so this can be my token for this color right here. When it comes to the secondary button, I reach blue 100 and now there are many, many ways I can do this. Eventually, when we cover more examples of how these components work, you'll understand how this naming actually works, right? Because uh, I know for a lot of beginners, this would now start to become slightly complicated. And this entire concept needs a lot of additional learning as well. And this course is not for understanding tokens or for UX design. The only reason why I'm explaining you a brief about tokens is because you need to know why you need to learn styles. And styles is a feature of Figma. So even though we will have detailed videos that teach you how tokens work, this was just to make you understand that tokens allow you to reference a root value in different ways, right? Because you can't really communicate in hex code. So this concept is pretty, pretty long. Uh, but today we will just understand why do we need styles in the first place. The link to download this presentation will be in the description, but there's a password for it. And this is the password. Please make sure that you copy this password before you download the presentation. So let's start with module number two. Let's study some real systems. Okay, let's understand what exactly do big companies do. And for this, I always recommend people to study Uber's design system and it's called Base. So if you go to base.uber.com, you will have access to their entire library. On the left, they have this thing called as design tokens. And if you click on usage, you can actually understand how they have built their design tokens and what was their logic behind it. Now, I will not cover everything. Uh, you will have to even watch this video at least two times and you will have to go through their website as well. Uh, and if it gets confusing, don't quit because that is what most students do. They just quit if they feel like, oh, this is kind of getting complicated. Stick with it. Watch this video also one more time and it'll start making sense for you. But let me show you how Uber has built their design tokens. So basically they have explained the fact that, you know, whether it's a color, whether it's a spacing value or a text size, whatever it is, you will have a name and you will have a value. Okay, you remember in that case, we had the value was a hex code and you had a name. Even in this example, this is my value and this is my name. Now for a token to work, a name is required. The value is required. But in a lot of cases, if you want to say that, uh, do I have to put the type inside the token name? Do I have to type the word color or text when I'm naming the token? Not necessarily. So this is still optional. And you also have an option to add descriptions when you're creating these components and styles inside Figma. So these are also optional. In engineering, they don't say name and value. They have another lingo. They call it as key and value. 
So let's just say that you have this color right here. This would be my value, but key would be button primary and they would call it as dollar sign button dash primary. We don't use the dollar sign inside Figma, but when developers use it, they use key value. So in design, we have names for every value in engineering. It's just the same as having a key for every value. Now, why the word key? Because this key is unique. You cannot have two keys with the same name. So that is why they've sort of called it as key because every key is unique, right? So in engineering, uh, they've used this word because you can't say have the word primitives.blue.600 as a key that has different values. This one single key will be connected to a singular value. Now, as I said, tokens can be used for many, many things. So in Uber, they use tokens for eight supported types. They use it for colors, typography, layout grids, dimensions, corner radii, haptics, like a lot of stuff. In today's session, because we are covering styles, majorly styles are useful for your colors and typography and shadows. And even in that today, we will mostly focus on understanding color tokens because those are the ones that slightly become confusing because you have multiple layers. Uh, but of course, when we talk about key and value, this value can't just be a hex code. It can be a string. It can be a Boolean value, which is true or false. It can also be a number or an integer. It could be anything, right? So today we are just covering colors, but when you go through this website, you realize that, oh, there's a lot for each and every type. Now, the interesting part is that let's say I go inside the color section and inside colors, I have a bunch of tokens, right? So what they do is, for every single token, you have a token name. Each token name basically has two components. Okay. In these two components, component number one is where you tell the type of this token as to where this token going to be used. Now, if I give you a quick example, right here, you have the color black. So this is my global token. Now this black is now referenced as content primary and border selected. Now, when I say the word content, for them, content means text. Okay. So if I'm using this as text, they are basically saying that we are using black color for primary text, but we're also using the color black for a border when it is selected. Then again, within content primary, they are referencing the same token as secondary button content and input value text. So they're saying that when we create an input box, when you type something, Inside that input box, when you add the text, that also is pitch black. When you have a secondary button, and you know, mostly secondary buttons are gray in color. So the text in the middle, it would be black. Now, if you look at all of this differentiation, you would see that there are three zones. This is zone one. You see this gray line. This is zone two. This is zone three. This would be called tier one. This would be tier two. This would be tier three. This is where we're in the theme section, but this is where we go component specific. So inside Uber's design system, within only the color type, you can have three tiers and we will discuss the naming for these three tiers as to how they have come up with this logic. Why is this called content primary? Why is this called secondary button content? Okay. Now this doesn't mean that the same rules will be applied for spacing or for typography, or even they will have three tiers. No, only the color tokens will have three tiers. Also, a lot of people say that three tiers mean the token name will have three parts. No, that does not mean this only has two parts. It has the type and then it has the context. Okay. So it is not necessary that three tiers mean that the name will have three parts. Not at all. It's just that they have the option to jump from zone one to zone two to zone three. And it basically means that the same color can be used across three levels. That is why they call it as three tiers. Now I'll show you how they have organized their color token types. Step number one, they declared all of their primitives. Like literally, uh, they took a bunch of hex codes that they had shortlisted and they gave them global names. Okay. And they have like more than hundred hex codes. Like they have a huge library of every single possible color that their teams can use. Okay. Now, even the marketing team can only pick from this. The product team can also only pick from this. Now from the primitives, they have picked some specific colors that they call as foundation colors, which is, you know, basically an alias for their brand color. So these are their brand colors and it has only six values. Then they have the third bucket, which is called core, which are just their grays. So you remember we have, were declaring grays when we were making our three buckets. Uh, in this case, they have four buckets, right? So they have primitives, they have foundations, which are so-called the brand colors. And here they have cores, which are basically their grays and they have picked 17 values. 
from this entire palette so i think it's mostly going to be from these light grays and then they also have extension so basically for the same bright foundational colors they have like these neutral versions as well and some semantic colors you know for error state for success state then they also have some overlays as well so these are called scrims or blankets so there are 29 values as well they have one more category called programs i'm not putting those here because it'll just confuse you but basically programs are colors that don't change as you go from light theme to dark theme so all of these colors right here they might switch uh but when programs the colors don't change so it's just another bucket of colors but all of them are coming from my primitives now let me show you how uber defined their grays they said that of course the core is built from the primitives you know stuff like gray 100 gray 200 gray 600 this is like the meat and potatoes of the entire system and then they say that our grays are also split into three categories one is your background which are your surfaces then we have content which is your text right any text any icon that you have it comes on the content and then you have borders which are just the strokes around your surfaces so they've sort of split their grays all to into specific use cases that you can only use these for the surfaces you can't use any of these right and for content also you can only switch between these and for borders you can only switch between these now let me show you how they are practically used so for example here we have three different components you have three kinds of buttons and icons you have input fields and here you have another accordion sort of a thing now here if i look at this component if you look closely literally any single component in uber's library can be broken down into atoms and this atom can only be one out of these three things it can either be a background or content or border so your icons and text they all come under content but the surface comes under background here my heart and this chevron this becomes content the background is pretty straightforward in this case all the text inside content this label is content the icon is content the border is black and then this is the background and of course i think uh, you get the drill right even in this case the minus plus all the text layers become my content and when i say content it means that they can only pick from these colors right here these tokens right here and where did we get these tokens from we got them from this big bank so a single color is being referenced across tiers right and you remember what i was saying this thing right here this component layer this is the kind of colors that we would have added right so when you have input value text it basically means that input the value text it is a content is it a background no right is it a border no so your first decision was to first decide that whether this color is being used in my backgrounds or in my borders or in my content when i'm taking this decision i am actually asking myself that okay i jumped from this state to this state but now within this state i need to check what what kind of color i'm choosing am i going to do something which is around designing the background or content or border then within a content right here you can see that you have different kinds of content right you have the label text and you have the icon so even though the color is identical even though the color is absolutely white it is the same color but my token name is going to be different so here it would be probably like input text primary here it would be like icon fill primary right so hope this is making sense and hope you're sort of able to understand uh, why do we need to sort of create this abstraction right now as i said a token can fall into three tiers and let's say your color token name will have your color type and your tier when we were creating these rules right root value global name alias name component specific name even uber has done something very specific in my example i had created four layers uber only keeps it to three layers so i said as a root value and from my root value i called it as a global name they say that this global name is actually the primitive token so instead of using the word global name they call it as primitive token so if i were to make the system i would call black as the global name uber is calling it as a primitive token then the global name once it has been attached to the primitive token there is an alias to that primitive token as well so the same thing goes and becomes this and they are calling it as a semantic token so i was calling it as alias and then at the very end the semantic tokens can then become component specific tokens so of course it is just like different names but the underlying concept is the same now 
just to make sure that we revise all of these things and just to make sure that there's absolute full clarity when i look at a token name the token name tells me two very very important things first of all it tells me the type whether it's color size or a stroke and then the tier tells me the context and the state at which the component is now the more narrow the intended use case the more precise the naming for example when i take at this example this thing is not a very narrow use case right but this is like a very very narrow use case like a very specific like it's for a, for the secondary button within the secondary button it is in the content so the token name becomes longer and longer so as you go from tier 1 to tier 2 to tier 3 to tier 4 the naming becomes more and more complicated and by the way they have these bunch of videos uber has created these videos and they call it as screen casts they will tell you a lot about how this entire thing works right so uh, they have this very simple diagram where they say that the hex is accessed by a primitive name this is a primitive name and then the primitive is then accessed by the token name which is content accent so you know in a lot of design system articles and a lot of token articles you will see this formula that token equals name plus value people think that name plus value means you take the name you take the value you stitch it together it becomes your token name no 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 they are saying this is just logically this is what they're trying to tell you this is not a formula for writing your name they are just saying that maybe content accent is one name which is which is linked to the value blue 600 then blue 600 becomes another name which is again linked to the value of the hex code so that is how when we were sort of discussing in the very very beginning right we had this topic right here where we said that in design we have names and value right we had names and value here in this case what they've done is the name is primitive and the value is the hex code so hope this made sense now the question is how do you finally declare these how do you declare these levels of abstraction inside figma unfortunately styles only allow you to go from hex code to the global name so you can't really have global name being converted to the alias or alias being converted to a component specific token and that is a limitation and that is why figma has introduced this new topic called variables so variables allow you to create a root value and then link the root value to a global name then the global name is linked to an alias alias is linked to a component and blah 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 for a very long time people in the design world what they were trying to do is they would create different global names for the same color so you they would choose the color black declare it as text primary also declare it as contrast one and blah 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 and it would just become very cluttered because you would have so many style names all linked to the same color and if you had to change the color in one single spot you had to go to individual styles one by one because there's only one layer uh but you know even now color styles are still pretty pretty useful and before you understand how variables work i think it's very very important you understand how color styles work right so let's understand that how do we really create these color styles and type styles and how do you declare them inside figma so let's start with module number 3 where we actually understand how do you declare your color styles and type styles now folks just to remind you again this is not a design system course this is a figma course so i will just show you how do you save your color styles but we will not get into the details of what kind of colors do you need to establish for that my 15 episode course is good enough because if you finish the color styles i explain here you can not only use them for your ui but you can also use them for your social media so at this point styles really help me to create better carousels and better stories for my social media because in social media you just have like one layer of like naming right and what you can do is that once you save a specific color let's just say that i create this color right here and i just call it say let's pick like a subtle red all you have to do is click on these four icons right here and this is where you can have access to all of your styles now you would be seeing that i have some styles here and then i have like this weird title and a bunch of names here as well so the thing is this is the concept of libraries and we will cover that in a while assume that i have five different figma files and in the first file i have declared all of my main colors my primitives my cores whatever it is but now in my file number 2 i am making the mobile app in file number 3 maybe i'm making the website i want file number 2 and file number 3 to access my colors from the first file so to share all of your styles from one file to another you need libraries so what i've done here let's just say that if i select this color click on these four dots right here and 
go to this plus button right here. I will have a new window where it asks me, do I need to save this as a style or a variable? Now we haven't covered variable yet. So I will just click on style here. I can give this a name. We've covered the naming in detail in our 15 episode course. It's called declaring your UI palette. But just to give you a very, very simple principle, you can just do something as simple as say, if these are your grays, then you do gray slash, then base one, base two, base three. If it is your brand, you do brand slash X, Y, Z, right? If it is a semantics, so I can do sem slash and I can do alert one, right? And then you can also add a description, which would be visible to your designers. If you click on this icon right here, you can choose in between all of these colors, the alpha levels. In fact, you can also save your gradients. You can also save image fills and you can also save the same for videos. So I will simply click on create a new style and now I will have it saved right here. The benefit of the slash convention is that once I click outside and if I see all of my local styles here, so local style means that all styles declared in this specific Figma files, you'd see my text styles. I will show you how to declare these and you will see your color styles like this. Because I had named the style as sem slash alert one, semantic slash alert one, it is now part of a group. So if I declare another color, which is sem slash article two, I will again have it in that similar group. Now, let me just get rid of all of these styles. I can simply select delete style and delete all of these one by one. And let me show you how I would establish my grays, right? So we had created these grays, right? Let's take these rectangles, bring them out. Now there are two things you need to learn very, very carefully to declare your color styles quickly. One is that once they are arranged in order, you need to make sure that you use the sorter plugin. And we had tried this out in our video too, as well, where I showed you how important it is to make sure that your layers panel ordering and your actual canvas ordering is identical. Once I have sorted them, I will do command slash again and go and click on rename selection. So this is called batch renaming. And here I will make this as gray and just slash. Okay. Now what happens is that all of these are now called gray slash. Now I will select the first four, which are just my base again, go and click on rename selection. Now the fun part is that I want something to add on top of gray slash. So I can simply select current name and to select color name, it just puts dollar and the Amberson sign, which is the and sign. Now, if I type say unch, then you'll see in the left side preview, this is how my naming would look like, but I don't want it to call lunch. I wanted to call base. So I will make this as base dash. And then I want numbers. So if I want ascending numbers, I will click on this. If I want descending numbers, I will click on this. If I do ascending, then it'll add two small ends with a dollar sign. So it'll come as base zero one, base zero two, base zero three. If I delete one of these ends, It'll just keep it as base one, base two, base three, base four. And I want the ascending to start from one. Once I do that, you'd realize that this becomes my base one. This becomes my base two, this base three and this base four. And this is exactly what I wanted. I can do the same for the mid ones as well. I can go rename selection, do and, and then do mid and then dash and then dollar sign and N. I can choose these. Again, command slash rename selection dollar sign and and do contrast dash dollar sign N. So what happens is that once I select all of them, they all have the prefix of gray slash, but this second part is mid one, mid two, mid one, mid three. Now this is where you can save a lot of time. You need to install the styler plugin. And by the way, to install any of these plugins, you just need to go here, click on plugins and just type the word styler and just install that plugin, right? So you can just make sure that you have this plugin valid. I have installed it already. So I will select all of these command slash type generate styles. Now what Figma will do is that it'll take all of these layer names and then use these as my style names. As soon as I click on generate styles, instead of going for every single color and you know, for example, if I were to create this by going here, clicking on plus typing this name and doing this so many times with the styler plugin, I have all of my styles saved in just a second. And they're all neatly organized in my grace. 
Now, of course, I can go here, double click on this and call this as gray as well. And then you can do the same for your brand colors, your semantic colors and so on. So it's very, very useful uh, if you take this shortcut. And this is how, you know, color styles are sort of declared inside Figma. Now, if you were making it for a dark theme or a light theme, then you would have had light UI slash gray slash blah, blah, blah. Dark UI slash gray blah, blah, blah. But once we start using variables, I will actually teach you how this one symbol bank of colors, these one uh, set of colors, these are the ones that will be referenced in your light theme. The same ones will be referenced in your dark theme. So you will just have a bunch of primitives. The same subset will be used for light theme. The same subset would be used for dark theme because in the earlier days, you would have to create a separate set of styles for light, separate set of styles for dark. But now with variables, you can do the multi-level thing, but we will not cover that today because I just want to make sure that this video is just about telling you how these styles are sort of created, right? So I would totally recommend you to check out our detailed video, which was on UI styles. Coming to the typography styles, first of all, when it comes to choosing the right typefaces, I would totally recommend you that if you're using even for your marketing or for your UI, please make sure that you only stick with Google fonts, right? And in terms of Google fonts, you know, there's so many websites that give you font recommendations, but the most important part about Google fonts is that they have a lot of filters and you always get open source fonts. Like they make sure that you have license to use these fonts and they are easy to load. They are pre-fed inside Figma. So you don't have to locally, you know, install them in your laptop or your designers don't need to install them in their laptops. And you know, in typography, there's a very, very important topic of pixels versus M's versus REMs, which again, we have really, really went into details of how those work in our video, which is titled basics of UI typography. It is in the 15 episode course. I would totally recommend you to watch that video after you finish this one. Now, when it comes to type styles, let's just say that I want to save this type style. I want to fix this font. Figma only saves these properties right here, but they will not save the color. So if I save this type style as a heading style, it will not save the color. It will only save the font size, the line height and all of these things, right? So these are the properties that it saves. And it's very, very simple. You just have to click on these four dots, click on this plus icon again, and then name the type style, right? Now, the question is that how many type styles do you save and how exactly do you break these down? So I told you that in your colors, you had your grays, your semantics and all of these colors, but what happens in a type style? So first of all, one very important rule, you never go below 12 pixels. 12 pixels is the smallest size and there's no rule for increments. For example, the first one can be 12, the second one can be 14, 16. The main point is that you should have options that are limited, but also visually very distinct from each other. For example, there's very, very, insignificant difference between 12 pixels and 13 pixels. So I would just keep it at 12, 14, 16, 18, 24. And your mobile app will have a different type system. Your web app will have a different type system. This is a very, very common mistake that students make that they feel that uh, a single type scale will fit for all of their devices. It doesn't work that way. So what happens is that you majorly have like three categories of type styles. Okay. One is your label text. So label text is, you know, single line text. The second category is your display and display is just like a alias name for headings. So like for big font sizes, you have displays for single line text, you have labels and then you have paragraphs, right? So let's just say that I want to declare my labels, right? Uh, I will start from my 12 pixels. And by the way, let me just detach all of the styles. I was just trying this out before teaching you folks. I will just delete all of these styles and I will go to label five. This is at 12 pixels. And when it comes to labels, because I know that this is going to be a single line text, the line height has to be 100%. It should not have any extra spaces. I personally use internet minus 2% line spa letter spacing, but it completely depends on you. And paragraph spacing has to be zero and it has to be on auto width. So I will choose 12, I will choose 14 and 16 and 18 and then 24. Now, exactly how we did with colors, I'm going to do something very similar right here. So I'm going to take these out of the auto layout, take these and now I'm going to rename them. Let's just say that they have a random name by default. Okay. So my first responsibility is to make sure that I select what category of type this is. Is this a paragraph or a display or a label, right? So I will probably go and make this as label slash. Okay. 
Now the thing is, when you are choosing the names, you need to make sure that you, for you as a designer, you can instantly figure out whether this is a uh, regular or bold or what size this is for. And there's also one very common convention: the biggest size always has the lower number. So I could have named this as L one, L two, L three, L four, which is label one, label two, label three, label four. But the bigger size gets the shortest number. So basically, twelfth pixel one would be called label five, and the biggest one would be called label one. But I can't have this as my style name. So what I would do is I would keep it very concise. I will have label one as my group name, but within labels group, this is how I will rename them. I will call this as L, and then because I probably want these in a different uh numbers i will probably have dollar n so now it'll be l1 l2 l3 l4 l5 okay then i can press dash and then i can do reg which stands for regular because this is my weight and i want to see it visually as well as in the type style because it sometimes it becomes very tough to sort of see visually but if you see reg then you instantly know that this is reg now a very important thing to note here is that when you designers say the word regular developers Actually, signify this in forms of numbers. So for them, it's not regular, but it's actually a weight of the font. In most cases, you can find the number by going to Google Fonts. In this case, regular is going to be four hundred for me. So I can name this as regular four hundred. And when I click on rename, you'd realize that label five has a layer name which is now L five Reg four hundred. Now the benefit of this is that I can duplicate these items. Go to say this one label five. Make this bold. Make this bold again. Let's make this one bold as well. And now this is no longer reg four hundred. Now this is probably say bold six hundred because they usually have increments of hundred, right? So if this is four hundred, this is five hundred. This is six hundred. This is seven hundred. So it's going to be seven hundred. Now instead of renaming them from scratch, I can do Command R, and here in my match, I can type Reg four hundred. Now it'll replace Reg four hundred with whatever I type here. So I will write Bold seven hundred, and rename them. And now I have this and this. Now the fun part is that I completely forgot to add the word label before this. So I can again do Command R, and let's just make sure that they are sorted properly, right? So let's run the sorter plugin before I rename them. So let's do sort position. I will select all of them, rename selection, and then just write the word label slash current name. So now whatever the names that they have already, I am just adding a prefix to the same name. So I will simply click on rename, and now I have all of my styles ready. I will go to my styler and generate styles. As soon as I do that, you realize that I have all of my text labels right here. Now the fun part is that you can either keep them in a single group or you can use the slash convention and put. uh you know all the l5s together or maybe all the regular text together so you know there are many many ways that you can group these out i just wanted to show you how do you use sorter and layer naming in styler to declare these quickly but for individual understanding of how do you declare these type styles you should 100% check out the video that we had on the 15 episode course right now when it comes to displays of course you have bigger font sizes you can keep a 135% line height but when it comes to paragraphs 100% you need to have at least 135% of the font sizes now there's a huge difference here I don't want you to write 135% here I want you to calculate 135% of this and then add the line height make it into a proper integer value and keep it very very explicit because I've noticed that it uh, usually ends up in a lot of complications when you use like exact 135% as the percentage sign so make sure that you calculate numerical values and of course you can have them as paragraph p7 p6 p5 and it would just work out and in most cases i recommend to have just two weights regular and bold like it usually works pretty well now there are three figma plugins that are extremely useful i would not implement them right now because they are just very straightforward you will love them one is find and replace so sometimes you have to swap words across your 
your figma page and maybe they are not into a component you have to individually fix those spellings one by one so this works exactly how find and replace works in notepad and uh, you know microsoft word uh, but now it's inside figma as well then you also have ghost ux writer so they give you a lot of good dummy copy that you can add to your text whether it's for error states or login errors or you know confirmations and all those things and then we also have spell with three l's at the end which is like a spell check for figma because i keep seeing so many students uh, make very silly spelling mistakes because they just don't do spell check now as i said once you have declared your styles you can go to your assets panel and click on this book icon right here and when you click on publish all of your 27 components components are basically those buttons and uh, things that we have saved right you remember in lecture 2 we had created that diamond sign where you had one button component you can save all of these components and declare styles in this file and then publish this as a library so for example in this specific file that I'm showing you right now, I have included libraries of other Figma files. So there are colors that I regularly use. There are icons that I regularly use. So I've added them here. So they are all visible. All I need to do is add to file. Now I can click on this publish icon and then it'll show me that, okay, these are the type styles that you want to declare. As soon as I click on publish, it takes around one or two minutes depending on how many components and styles you have. But once done, if you have a pro plan, you need a pro plan for the syncing of these libraries. If you have the pro plan, then now you can declare styles in one part and then access them in another. And this is how it practically works even in real design systems, right? So you have one file where you just declare your core components and your design system and your colors. And then you publish a library of that. And then whatever app or any website or any project that you make that happens in a separate Figma file and you enable this core design system library in your mobile Figma file, in your web Figma file. And you know, that is how you sort of keep things organized. So a very, very useful use case for beginners would be that if you go to Figma community and you install or duplicate the box icons file, it is better to publish a library of the box icons file and then use that library inside your working file a lot of people they copy the box icons and they paste them inside their figma file and you know it's just not a very modular way of doing things so it is always better that you keep all of your assets organized in separate separate libraries so that you can enable them one by one now before i leave i want to give you some resources for inspiration i keep sharing them in all of my videos not going to go through them one by one but all of these websites will really really help you take a lot of inspiration for ui and web design then here are four websites that can help you learn figma even though i am uploading these videos if you want to feel that you want to do more you will have to do more by the way and this is not for ux design this is for learning figma these four websites are really really cool also we had upload episode two but i felt like a lot of people didn't finish the episode two so please make sure that you're catching up on the syllabus and you're regularly telling me in the feedback section as to what is it that you would want me to cover i would really really appreciate if you could just click on subscribe and hit the bell icon and like this video because it really helps us or uh, tell youtube that the content is really helpful now that i have introduced you a glimpse of design systems a glimpse of tokens i would totally totally recommend you to check out design systems repo.com so if i were to copy this link and open it it's extremely extremely vast and very very detailed so if i go here and click on design systems you will have a bunch of design systems that you can learn from for example if i go to say audi ui i can actually see the design systems that are used in real Audi cars, right? So I can go here and read how they have organized uh, for different viewports and for different screen sizes. So it's really, really inspiring to see how these big, big brands use design systems properly. Like you can also check out Carbon by IBM, another very, very inspiring design system. And as I said, once you go here inside your guidelines and inside your component section, you will see how they have organized every single thing. So within components, you can see how they have made their buttons, right? So if I were to double click on this, I think I have to just click on this accept all. Let me click on buttons. And you can see that they have full documentation. They show their primary, secondary, tertiary, danger buttons. It'll really, really teach you a lot. And the fun part is that they also have like live demos. So you can see 
the states that they interact with, right? You have all of these components, like very, very detailed documentation for students, right? Nothing is going to be theoretical. Once you make notes of what I have taught you and once you go through these resources, right? So one is designsystemsrepo.com. The other one is designsystemsforfigma.com where you can actually get the Figma files for all of these design systems. So when we go to a website like Carbon, or any of these online websites, right? This is still documentation. But on design systems for Figma, I can actually, let's just say if I had to check out Base, right? Which is by Uber. I can click on the Figma kit icon and it will take me to the exact Figma community page of Uber where I can get the official Figma file. So you can imagine how valuable this is, is for a person who really, really wants to get deep into UX, right? And you don't have to do this one by one. I would... 100% just remind you that we have created dedicated free courses for learning. We've just launched Learn UI UX in. And if you are confused about planning out your career and you don't know if this is the right option for you, uh, you should totally check out our basics videos on Learn UI UX in. There's one video which is the 2023 roadmap video which will really help you chart out your career plan give you tons of resources to get started as a full-time designer. Then of course the 15 episode course is there and every single resource that I mentioned is going to be there in the description. Please make sure that you follow through all the videos end to end. And folks, it takes at least six to eight months. I know that you would be seeing a lot of cohorts and certifications that say that we'll make you a designer in three or four months. I personally feel that just to learn Figma properly, just to learn the basics of UX, the basics of UX psychology, you need at least six to eight months of practice where you're spending two, two and a half hours every single day. After spending two, two and a half hours every single day, it'll take you eight months to become good enough for cracking a good high paying internship. And if you're stuck at your UX case studies, we've made a dedicated video on writing your first UX case study. There are two videos, at least one, one and a half hour long, and they will really, really tell you a lot of valuable things. Now, of course, I will not leave you without homework for the next five days. You need to make sure that you cover these things, right? So firstly, I know that a lot of stuff that we discussed in tokens, it might have intimidated you slightly, but the complex topics are, uh, you know, they're supposed to take time. Like you have to give them time. You have to read more. You have to watch content and you have to watch content again and again. So it takes time. It is simple, but it's not that easy, right? And I would recommend you to, of course, finish our color and type declaration and button declaration video from the 15 episode course. Of course, I made those videos like two years ago. Uh, but I would totally recommend you to watch them. They will still clear out a lot of your basics and make detailed notes on Notion. If you don't know how Notion works, I have created a very, very detailed video called how to document on Notion. I will paste the link in description and study the Polaris design system by Shopify or even based by Uber because these guys have documented things really, really well. And comment below if you enjoyed this video, comment below if you want me to make more such videos because we didn't see a very good response on episode two. Episode one did well, but I felt like a lot of people didn't watch episode two after episode one was finished. So uh, we're still very confused if we should continue this series or not, uh, because we're spending so much of time in curating these really in-depth videos. So if you feel that such in-depth content is not the right kind of videos and you're not able to keep up with it, then we'll sort of uh, shrink them down and make them more basic. And if you document something, make sure you post it on LinkedIn and tag me. I love your Instagram stories. It's always nice to, you know, see what you folks are up to. And yes, uh, we have covered the first three lectures. Lecture number four is going to be on components and variants. Again, very, very useful feature. I can't wait to sort of finish all the 10 lectures because once you've done these 10 lectures, we'll obviously move on to a lot of more exciting stuff, which is dedicated towards UX and spatial design and UX psychology in general. If you're here for the first time, make sure you click on subscribe and hit the bell icon. Let me know in the comment section if there's something specific you want me to cover in the components and the variants video because, you know, it's a very, very huge topic. I will try my best to squeeze in all the important information in the one hour long lecture. I usually record these videos for like a very, very long time and we edit them to make sure that, you know, we only keep the most, most valuable stuff in the videos. Again, please make sure that you like this video and share this within your community. If you're in the content circuit, if you're a good editor or if you're a good UX designer or if you're a good content script writer, 
Please send me your portfolios on admin at the rate anshmara.com. We are expanding our team. I'm looking for talent. So if you're interested in the field of content and UX design, I would love to see your work. Maybe we can collaborate together. Uh, we've also launched a website called howtoprom.in that has all of our videos on chat GPT, mid journey, prompt engineering, a lot of a lot of useful stuff is there. So if you're interested in the world of AI and prompt engineering, how to prompt in will solve all of your doubts. If you're interested in the world of UX design and UI design, then learn UI UX dot in will give you every single resource you need to get started in this field for free. Of course, we've been making a lot of content on spatial design as well that teaches you how to design applications for the Apple Vision Pro, which is an augmented reality. If you haven't connected with me on Instagram, do make sure that you send me a message on at the rate anshmera dot AI. We're regularly uploading a lot of updates from the world of AI and design. With that being said, I hope that you're taking care of your mind and body. This is your dost Ansh Mehra signing out. If you like this video, make sure you click on like and hit the subscribe button. I regularly upload videos on UX design, marketing and storytelling.